On Twitter, a few weeks ago, Joel Hampkins, a professor of logic at Oxford University, was reminiscing about a lecture he had seen 30 years ago. It was a lecture by historian of science. And unfortunately, Professor Hampkins could not remember the historian's name. But he did vividly remember the lecture itself. The historian started out the lecture sitting on a desk surrounded by huge piles of physics textbooks from the past. Each one of these books, he said, was the best textbook of its time. He picked up the oldest book, written by a student of Isaac Newton, which explained Newtonian physics and planetary motion. It was an excellent book for its time, he said, but even so, it included various mistakes and misunderstandings. The lecturer set the book aside and picked up the next one. This was also an excellent book, he said. It corrected some of the mistakes from the earlier book, but this new textbook had its own flaws. The historian moved on to the next book, and the one after that, and the next after that. For each one, the historian spoke of how it had improved upon the ones before it. But he also explained in some detail the things that the book got wrong. He continued from book to book, moving from each decade to the next, from each century to the next, until he reached the textbook used in the current Intro to Physics class. This is an excellent book, he said, and he explained why it was better than the earlier ones. And I don't know of anything that it gets wrong, he said, and placed it on top of the pile of all the books that had preceded it. It's nice to think, isn't it, that at this point in history, we've got it all figured out. We understand many things, and our understanding surely is correct. But history tells us that every generation gets some things wrong. And the problem is, we can't always tell now what exactly it is that we're getting wrong. This happens with big societal issues. It happens in science. It even happens in mathematics. And on a personal level, it happens to each of us in our own lives. Are there things that you believed 10 years ago that you've changed your mind about? I sure hope so. But because of that, it's almost certain that there are things that you believe now that you won't believe 10 years from now. There are things that you are confident about now that are wrong. So how can we continue on about our lives when we know that we are going to make mistakes? I think that the answer is that this is not an intellectual issue. It's an emotional issue. We need to accept the fact that we and others have made mistakes. We and others have been wrong about things. We and others are currently wrong about some things. But this does not make us failures. It simply means that we are human. And the only way to improve ourselves is to sit with our history, to face the good and the bad, even when it makes us extremely uncomfortable to do so. Let me give you an example from our universalist history. Our reading today was the second half of a poem that Maya Angelou read at Bill Clinton's inauguration in 1993. The 1990s were a time of great optimism in much of America. The Cold War was over. Everyone was expecting to have a peace dividend that we could use for wonderful projects. Technology was progressing at an astonishing rate. And I chose that reading partly for its optimism. But there have been other periods of great optimism in the United States. Let me talk about one such time. Let me speak for a moment about universalism 
as it was a little more than a hundred years ago. At the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, the meaning of universalism was undergoing a change. Originally, universalists were Christians who denied the idea of eternal punishment. Universalists believe that heaven was universal, open to everyone. And although many of them believe that people would undergo some kind of temporary purgatory before being admitted to heaven. But gradually, around 100 years ago, universalism came to mean something wider than that specific Christian doctrine. Universalists were interested in finding the commonalities of all religion. They were interested in universal truths, so to speak. For example, that's one reason why Swami Vivekananda, a religious leader who tied Hindu thought to various Western ideas, spoke at dozens of universalist and Unitarian churches at the turn of the 20th century, including in California at the First Unitarian Church of Oakland and at the First Universalist Parish in Pasadena. So the meaning of universalism was widening in the early 1900s. And a universalist minister named Clarence Skinner was a cheerleader for the movement back then, a cheerleader and a leader. He is widely regarded by historians to have been the most influential universalist of his time. A little over a hundred years ago, he published a book called The Social Implications of Universalism. In the first chapter of this book, he wrote, Universalism meets the demands of the new age because it is the product of those forces which created the new age. It does not send its roots down into a medieval civilization interpreting past history. Its theology expresses the modern conception of the nature of God and man. Its motive power arises out of the new humanism. It is the philosophy and the power which under one name or another, the multitudes are laying hold upon to swing this old earth nearer to the kingdom of heaven. It is the religion of the people, for the people, by the people. It is the faith of the new world life sweeping upward to spiritual expression. Now that's optimism. Skinner thought that universalism would further science and defeat tyranny. It would support equality under the law. It would create a new social order based on the theological idea that all people are essentially spiritual beings. Skinner wrote that this theology would transform prison systems and shops. It would work its revolution in mine and mill it would seize upon wars, despotisms, slaveries, and abolish them. It would beget itself in flesh and blood. It would be the most actual, astonishing, and manifest fact in the world. Now, Skinner's book is a remarkable document, and it's a quick read. If you ask me later, I can post a link to free online copies of it. But once you have read it, and once you've heard Skinner's inspiring vision of a universalism that will heal the world, you have to sit back and think. He wrote this book in 1915. 1915. Even as he was writing that universalism throbs with hope and believes in the world and its potential goodness, even as he wrote those world words, World War I had started in Europe. 19th century battle strategies were meeting 20th century technologies, and the result was enormous suffering. Trench warfare, the widespread use of machine guns, the introduction of mustard gas. All of this was starting at the very time Skinner was writing that never before have we had such a basis for our hope that there shall be no more misery or sin. In the 30 years immediately following the publication of Skinner's book, there were two world wars, bracketed by the genocide of the Armenians, 
at the, in the very year the book was published and the genocide of the Jews in the 1940s. Now, of course, hindsight is, is easy. And I don't want to fault Skinner for his optimism. Optimism is important. We need to see where there are good things in this life. But it is also pretty striking how wrong Skinner was about the immediate future. And when we think about a historical figure like Skinner, it's really important that we think not just about what parts of his theology he got right, but also about the things he got wrong, like missing World War I. But there are other things that Skinner got wrong as well, things that are more serious than not being able to predict the future. Because Skinner, despite his universalism, was also a eugenicist. Skinner wrote about hope which he called instinctive and impulsive in religions of the past, but which he said had now turned into reasoned optimism based on the progress that had been made in the preceding century in medicine and education and economics and industry and above all in social work. He wrote, criminology brings incontrovertible evidence that delinquency finds its roots in congenital defect and preventable neglect. And eugenics hold forth, holds forth an alluring picture of a perfected race produced through the social control of birth. Congenital defects. He means some people are just born criminals. Some people who in practice generally did not look like him and who did not have the same social capital that he had. He was not alone in thinking that eugenics would improve humanity. Ministers, social activists, scientists, there were eugenicists among them all. For instance, Caltech is only now coming to terms officially with the fact that some of its faculty and donors in the first part of the 20th century were leaders in the so-called Human Betterment Foundation. This includes Robert Millikan, a physicist famous for an experiment that measured the electrical charge of the electron. With the support of the Human Betterment Foundation, the state of California sterilized 20,000 mental patients and prison inmates, mostly without their consent. These people were disproportionately Mexican and Mexican-American. The Human Betterment Foundation thought that this was only a start and that more people should be sterilized for the benefit of the race. So eugenics too is part of the legacy of Clarence Skinner. And even as we claim him as a strong voice for universalism in the 20th century, we also have to accept his role in the racist ideology of eugenics. Of course, it's not just Clarence Skinner. We have to learn to accept historical figures in all of their complexity, not as heroes, but as complicated people who made mistakes and who sometimes did actual evil. This can be, motion this can be emotionally difficult, and it's not always easy to figure out how to think about people and their work when you know more about them. Caltech, for instance, just decided this month to remove the names of Millikan and other eugenicists from certain buildings and named fellowships. This does not mean that Millikan's science will be forgotten. It simply means that maybe he's not the best person to name the library after. Bravely and compassionately facing the historical truths about people in the past, putting their lives in their full context, and yet holding them accountable for their actions. This is, in fact, an exercise that will help us on a personal level, as well as a societal level. Each of us, in our own life, has made mistakes. Each of us has hurt people, sometimes through carelessness, sometimes through ignorance, but sometimes also through our own weakness by giving in to spite or to hatred. 
it is important to face those parts of ourselves and bravely and with compassion and yet holding ourselves accountable. If we ignore our mistakes, we will make them again. And if we beat ourselves up over our mistakes, we will not be improving ourselves. What do we need in order to take stock of ourselves bravely and compassionately? I think that one necessary component is humility. Humility. Humility means knowing that we may be wrong about certain things. It means knowing that other people might know more than us, and they might be more capable than we are at certain things. Humility means seeing ourselves as part of a larger system, a larger community, where our contributions are sometimes important, but are always only part of the picture. Seeing ourselves in this way is a spiritual practice. We can know both that we are just specks in an inconceivably large universe and that our lives are important. We are a small part of the interconnected web of all existence and we have inherent worth and dignity. Both are true. We as individuals are nowhere near perfect, but we are supported by love and community that can complement our failings and our strengths. When we reach the end of our lives, we will see the dividends of this spiritual practice. At the end, we will look back with clarity on all we have done, and we will face the good and the bad, the loving and the hurtful. We will need the humility to ask forgiveness of those who we hurt or neglected, knowing that forgiveness is not guaranteed. And we will need the grounding of our faith in order to truly accept the gift of forgiveness if it is offered. Then, when the book of our life is closed and it is set down on the stack of all the other books of life that went before it, we will trust that someone, our loved ones, our community, our God if we have one, the spirit of life, we will trust that someone will see that we too have improved the world in some small way, even if we got some things wrong. We have history. We have humility. And now I would like to circle back to hope. Who decides what stories get counted as history? Who decides how to interpret these stories and what perspectives we take when we tell them? Who decides what their meaning is? Do we learn about eugenics from the point of view of the eugenicists or from that of the immigrants who were forcibly sterilized or from people who chose to be on the sidelines? Do we tell the story of Thanksgiving as the pilgrims tell it? Or do we listen to the tales passed down by the Wampanoag? And what lessons do we choose to emphasize? All of these choices are influenced by power. And it benefits the powerful if we all think that change is impossible and that history must repeat itself. We can fight that, you and I, by our own choices of the stories to tell and the perspectives we take, the interpretations we give and the lessons we learn. There is hope to be found in history, hope that change is possible. Change is possible for us as individuals and for our nation if we find and tell the right stories. In the words of today's centering thought, we honor our ancestors not because they are perfect, 
but simply because they came before us and made our lives possible. May our descendants also honor us, despite our imperfections, because we built on what came before us and left foundations for those who follow. May our descendants honor us also, because we gave them hope. Blessed be.